All right. One last good sharpening and I'll call this blade done. <sighs> Do your blades need sharpening too? I'd be happy to take care of it for you if you want. No thanks. I was taught never to leave my lifeline in the hands of another. Sure. Sounds like you found a good teacher. <sighs> I don't care if it's me who does it, as long as you're keeping them well maintained. Just in case you don't already know, after you sharpen your blades, you should rub them with clove oil and wipe them down with wool. Yeah, I know. I was taught that too. By the man who killed my brother. What's wrong? Are you not feeling well? Uh, my compass fell on my head and gave me a bump. Let me take a look. Oh, wow, yeah, that's a big one. But that must hurt. Yeah, but at least I'm still alive. Are you saying that pain is proof that you're really alive? That's what Velvet told me. <sighs> well, no worry. I'll just push your bump back down. You'll be good as new. Wait, what? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Don't sweat it. Stop fooling around, you two. We have to hurry. Once we get back to the ship, just borrow some sugar and rub it on your bump. It'll make the swelling go down. Oh, okay. You know, you're pretty good with your fists, Aizen. Not as good as you are with your swords. I feel like I've seen a lot of your crew with swords. Do you really never use them yourself? No, not with the Reaper's curse I don't. It likes to rear its head at the worst times. I've broken blades just by unsheathing them, and once, just as I was about to deliver a finishing blow, my blade separated from the hilt and went flying. That sort of thing. A sword isn't something I can rely upon when my life is at stake. I fight using only my own body. That's one less thing that can go wrong. It's too bad you're not a swordsman. I bet we could have had a hell of a fight. I wouldn't need a sword to make it interesting. What do you say? Want to try your sword against my curse? Sure, if the right time comes. Just don't whine when I end up winning. You took the words right out of my mouth. The exorcists sure were out in full force to see the Shepherd's inauguration, weren't they? What about that guy you're after? Was he there? What, and have to stand around looking all proper? Now nah, that's not his style. Then I thought he was one of the top exorcists. That wouldn't matter to him. Huh. All right. Actually, Velvet, speaking of the Shepherd, I noticed he wasn't using his right arm. Was he hurt or something? Yeah. He was badly wounded a long time ago. He lost the use of his sword arm. That's what I figured. But don't get the wrong idea. He's still a master swordsman with his left arm. I can tell that from the way he moves. His movements are steady and measured, and his chi is centered below his navel. Huh? Why does that matter? Some people say that all the body's spiritual energy gathers in a place about two finger widths below the navel. Even when he appears to be in a state of total peace, his guard is never down. He's a formidable adversary. <laughs> and I think I know why my target has placed himself at Artorius's side. Because now I want to take Artorius down too. Those Sylph Jays are handy little birds, aren't they? Not only will they always find their destination, they can make for emergency rations in a pinch. I hear grilled sylph jay goes rather well with a nice glass of the hard stuff. It's because of the work those birds do for us that we're able to stay one step ahead of the Abbey. Those birds are indispensable to us pirates, and we consider them a part of our crew. Don't even joke about eating them. <laughs> all right, all right. Still, I wonder how they actually do their thing. I know that carrier pigeons rely on their homing instincts, but sylph jays can locate a person wherever they are, right? They're really smart birds. I read in a book that rather than memorizing locations, they can pick up on people's wavelengths. When you send out a sylph jay, the bird can sense the change in your thoughts and will seek out the recipient you have in mind. I hardly ever see them in the wild. Are they a kind of Moloch or something? No, they're not Molochim. 
They're just an incredibly rare species native to an island in the north. It's a funny story. A chance storm sent us docking at that island, and a mother sylph jay got blown onto our ship, eggs, nest, and all. Sadly, the mother bird died almost immediately. But Benwick stepped in and kept her eggs safe and warm. So that's why they're so attached to him. Usually, they're really hard to train as messenger birds, too. That's Benwick for you. He's always had a knack for things that would give other people trouble. Maybe when they hatched, they took one look at his wild hair and mistook him for their mother. You know what? They are comfortable enough with him to use his head for their nest. So you might have a point. Now that you mention it, he did ask me not to hit him on the head, because one of the sylph jays just laid her eggs. Well, if more birds are on the way, we could just eat one to see how it tastes. No! Don't even think about it! <laughs> it was worth a try. <sighs> it's not often you find bright steel above ground. I hear it's a lot of trouble to unearth, even in the regions it's normally found. Yeah. Mining for minerals takes a lot of specialized techniques and experience on the part of the prospector. They examine the soil, the water, the plants, and so on, where the same mineral was found before, then search similar environments for the next big find. Sure, but it's not like they succeed every time. It's all a big gamble. Isn't there a simpler way? I read in a book once that you can use a pendulum to find water and metals underground. It's called dousing. What's dousing? You hang the pendulum so it's facing the ground. Then you chant the magic word, Magic Kazam, and wait to be amazed. The little bit of ore on its tip will sniff out buried treasure in underground lakes like a bloodhound on a prickle boar. You don't seriously believe this. Eh, it's just like fortune telling. You win some, you lose some. That's why they call it prospecting. So, if pendulums are used for fortune telling, why the hell is Zavid running around using them as weapons? He uses wind to control its trajectory. I think it's easier for him to manipulate pendulums in a fight than something like a whip or a rope. Oh, that makes sense now. That seems pretty clever. He's probably also doing it to make himself stronger, too. Malakim broadly fall into four elemental types. Earth, water, wind, and fire. Each strong or weak against the others. Wind beats Earth. Savid is a wind Malak. So when he obtains Earth element minerals, his own strength is boosted. I never realized Malakim could be so calculating. Then if pendulums react to a Moloch's powers, maybe they can actually do this dousing stuff like Magilu says. Yeah, it's worth taking that thing seriously. Zavid might like to joke around, but when it comes to fighting, he knows full well just what he's doing. He puts an awful lot of thought into that weapon of his, if you ask me. You don't? I spare all my thoughts for my sweetheart. Yeah, right. You just like to cause trouble without putting much thought into anything. That Rokuro, always telling all of us except Eleanor to work harder. Doesn't he realize that I'm a delicate maiden too? This is workplace discrimination. I should put him on a witch trial and burn him at the stake. I don't think that's how witch trials work. <laughs> What's wrong, Eleanor? You look like you've got something on your mind. I'm just trying to figure out what Rokuro was thinking. When I had Lord Shigure at the end of my spear, Rokuro threw his dagger right at my head. I thought I was dead for sure. I feel like I saw who he truly was, and it frightens me. But he and Lord Shigure are always trying to kill each other. I can't understand why he did what he did. It might have something to do with his Bushido code. What's Bushido? Is that like a sword fighter's code? It's a way of thinking. Be loyal to your lord, respect your parents, protect the weak, and act with honor. You're saying that he was following this Bushido code, and he was protecting me because I was weak? He might have turned into a demon, but his memories and personality are still intact. I doubt his moral values have disappeared either. Do you really think he believes in that Bushido stuff? Carving through his enemies with a cruel and unsparing sword! Slash! Pow! Shazam! That's the true nature of a Rangetsu man! I heard that when Velvet first met him, he immediately attacked her without any provocation. 
I'm sure you haven't already forgotten how he turned his swords on the kid in that fight against Kurogane. I wouldn't read too much into what Magilu's saying. Rokuro lives for his sword, and that's just who he is. But I don't think he's all that bad. I thought you were the one who called him frightening. I know I said he can be a scary person, but... How do I put it? I do feel there's more to him than just wanting to cut people up. It's like... He's more sensitive to other people's emotions than he might seem to be at first glance. A sword fighter has to sense his opponents on some level, right? For a crazed demon, he's actually a nice guy. Is that it? Maybe. I don't know. It's not like I know him well enough to claim any deep personal insight or anything. You brought it up. Laffy said, have you been taking care of that rhino stagros like a good boy? Of course. I make sure to feed it every night before I go to sleep, since it's nocturnal. How long are you going to keep on calling it a rhino stagros? I don't know. It's a new kind of beetle, so it's going to be hard to tell if it's really a rhino or a stag. You're asking a lot of questions. Bienfu, do you like bugs? Duh! I love rhinoceros and stag beetles both! What guy doesn't find them fascinating? Right? So which kind of beetle do you think it is? Rhino or stag? Oh, that's a tough question. But guess what? Miss Mogilu taught me a surefire way to tell. I didn't know there was a way to tell. Yeah, but if I do it, you gotta name it after me, alright? Uh... Come on! What guy doesn't wish he had a cool bug named after himself, right? And besides, Miss Mogilu told me that this technique is so good that it's only fair to have a bug named after you in return. So what do you say, man to man? Come on, let's live the dream! Oh, all right. How can I say no to that? Besides, we all did work together to capture it anyway. Yay! Thanks, Laffy Set. All right, show me the bug, and I'll tell you what it is. Miss Mogilu says you need to open up its outer wings and get a good whiff of the thin underwings. Uh, I'm pretty sure I remember rhinoceros and stag beetles smelling really nasty under their wings. Is it really that bad? Why not find out for yourself? Uh, no thanks. I think I'll pass. Maybe you shouldn't do this after all, Bienfu. You probably just want to hog the name all to yourself! Well, too bad! A real man never goes back on his word! If it packs a mean punch, then it's a rhinoceros beetle. And if it smells really zesty, then it's a stag beetle. I don't know about this. Just let him do it, Lafayette. He's already volunteered. I can do this! Just you watch! <laughs> this smell is the most bad, bad thing that ever bad, bad in it! Whoa! He fainted with his eyes still open! Hey, wake up! Wake up, Bianfu! Miss Mogilu, as soon as I smelled it, my nose literally exploded. He looks like he's having a bad dream. Velvet's demon hand. It's such a mysterious weapon. I can only imagine how much of a threat it will become to the Abbey. This calls for a clear-headed breakdown of everything I know about it so far. It changes shape in a flash, and could devour most anything. How must that feel, to devour something with your hand like that? But it doesn't devour the bandages that cover it up. Maybe they're protected with some sort of special art? Likewise, the rest of her outfit can't be ignored. One would think she wouldn't want to wear such ragged clothing, yet she clearly has no inclination of buying something new. I suppose that could be taken to mean she has some sort of attachment to it. But that top is really big for her. Like it was made for a man! Maybe she wears that outfit in memory of someone important to her. I'd better not touch it then. I know I may not look it, but I really am good at sewing. Maybe I should suggest mending her clothes rather than outright replacing them.
On the other hand, that fabric looks like it would be hard to push a needle through. I could be in over my head. But the tougher the fight, the more I get fired up! Of course, Lord Artorius would probably scold me if he heard me talking like that. Who'd scold you for what now? Oh, uh, well, I was thinking about sewing! I mean, your clothes, they're all beat up, and I thought that if I offered to mend them for you, you'd probably scold me, wouldn't you? You'd mend my clothes? Have they been worrying you that much? I mean, not like constantly or anything. It just crosses my mind from time to time. Are you good at it? Yes. I'm told I come across as awkward sometimes, but if nothing else, I'm good with my hands. I see. All right, if I ever need it done, I'll come to you. Good, just leave it to me. Are you feeling all right? You're really sweating. The heat and the cold doesn't bother me at all. But you're a human, so you need to take care of yourself. And if you keep soaking in your own sweat, you'll catch a cold. Besides, I don't imagine it feels that great. You should keep washing and bathing on your own schedule. Like however you did before falling in with us. Just let me know and I'll make it work. Because the guys aren't considerate enough to stop and ask you if you need to. Sure. Alright. Thanks. That was a surprisingly normal thing for her to say. I probably shouldn't bother with her clothes for now. We girls have to be considerate of each other. I noticed you've come up with your little name for the kid. You sure are the sentimental type, aren't you? Oh? Calling him Fee doesn't cost me anything, and it's not like I gave it much thought. That may be the case, but no one else has taken even that token effort. And in doing so, I wonder if maybe you were trying to encourage him to be his own being. After all, one requires a name before he can consider his own identity. Having been given a name, he realizes he is his own entity, separate from others, and a certain formless essence comes to life inside him. And you're the one who set that process in motion for the kid. Whether you intended to or not, you changed him from a puppet into a living being. So what's your point? I've been with you since the start of this journey, haven't I? Wouldn't kill you to give me a nickname, would it? I've never really thought of us as being that close. And besides... You just forced your way into the group. Come now! I know you've got a bigger heart than that! Surely you have it in you to give a nickname to a dear friend! We're not dear friends. And even if we were, I'm not good at nicknames anyway. Please! I'm begging you! Okay then. Moggy. Oh, come on, that's so obvious! Can't you put some heart into it for your dear friend? Fine. Lou. Do I look like an old man to you? You're not even trying! Okay, then. Witchy Mick Witcherton. Interesting. Well, if I had to rank it against 1,000 other nicknames, I'd probably put it at number 1,011. A nickname needs to have charm. It needs to leave a lasting impression. Sure, then. Hattie. Now you're just saying what you see! Book skirt. That's not any better, either! Ms. Creepy Eyes. That's just an insult! Look, no nicknames based on what you see, and especially no slandering! Lil Miss Witch who smiles around you but stabs you in the back when you're not looking. Hey, that's personal information! Look, I told you, I'm not good at coming up with nicknames. Forget it! I should have known this wouldn't work! You said that Malakim can have familial ties. But what makes you and your sister siblings, if you're not related by blood? Well, a very long time ago, I was born into this world from an Earth Pulse point up on a sacred mountain. I remained in that place for a long while. And then one day, she was born from the very same Earth Pulse point. Before we knew it, we had wound up living together under the same roof. Are two Malakim always siblings if they come from the same Earth Pulse point? No. The other Malakim were born there, but I never felt like they were my family. But something, and I don't know what, was different with her. If she was sad, I'd feel sad. And if I was happy, she'd be happy too. She can be abrasive, but when she smiles, it's like nothing else. I swore to myself that whatever happened, 
I would protect her. I made a pendant from a stone on that sacred mountain and gave it to her as a lucky charm. Of course, she just wears it as a necklace. And your pendant? Did she give that to you? She had the same idea I had. She made the pendant herself and gave it to me as a good luck charm. Without either of us having mentioned a word of it beforehand, we each gave each other pendants in the same shape on the very same day. That's when I really knew that what I had felt all along was true. We were brother and sister. Is that her in the picture? Yeah. It's a self-portrait she drew for me on the day I left home. Did you draw her a picture of yourself? No. I don't exactly have an artistic side. Well, I'm sure that if you looked inside her pendant, you'd find a portrait of the person who matters most to her. I hope so. Yeah, and it would be nice if it was you. <sighs> wow, Aizen. Your palmiers are every bit as delicious as the ones you can buy from a baker. It takes a lot of time and work to get that good. They say it takes three years to master caramel custard, but eight for palmier. I never figured you for someone who would be so passionate about baked sweets. What? So just because I'm a pirate, I can't bake? No, I didn't mean it like that. It's just that these are so good, and you made them with such perfect attention to detail. My sister likes palmiers. Ah, and she... Sounds like there's a story, if you don't mind us asking. You're right, there is. Back when she and I were living together, we went out to a human town where we discovered palmiers for the first time. My sister had never tasted sweets made by humans before, and she fell in love with palmiers at the first bite. After that, whenever I went into town, I made sure to pick some up for her. You picked them up for her? You mean you two didn't keep going there together? Being among humans puts Malakim in contact with malevolence. With my sister being prone to illness and injury, I wouldn't take her long to such places. When she'd be acting up or not sleeping or something, I'd promise to get her palmiers, and she'd calm right down. That sounds like how me and my brother used to be. After a while, I just figured that if she likes them that much, I might as well learn how to make them myself. Plus, that way you wouldn't expose yourself to as much malevolence. After I made them enough times, I got the hang of it. They started turning out really well. But one time when I was baking them, the oven suddenly spewed fire out and badly burned my sister. It was all my fault, and stupid, clueless me didn't even know why at the time. Crazy thing is, after I did what I could for her burns and put her to bed, she told me she wanted to eat the palmiers I'd made. They were burned to a crisp, but she ate those pastries like nothing was wrong. Then she smiled and told me to keep on making them. That's just like a younger sibling. <sighs> he just wanted to do something for his sister, only to be confronted by how bad his curse is. That'd be really hard to deal with. She must realize by now what's going on with Aizen, right? Maybe she thought that he'd leave if she ever let on that she knew. And he left because he thought he could spare her from learning the truth. Hmm. Hey, Aizen. What's it feel like to get a letter? I don't feel anything, nor do I want or need to. There's no joy in receiving these things. Huh? Why not? <laughs> don't be so shocked. Look, it's just an invoice from the Turtles. What's the big deal, anyway? Do you wish you'd get letters, too? Yeah. But I don't have anyone to send letters to, let alone anyone who would send me any. Laffy said, I've got a letter for you. What? Really? Who could it be from? The sender is... Bienfu? Yup, yup! You got a letter from yours truly! I figured you'd be wanting someone to send you a letter right about now, so I wrote one up for you. What do you think? You're happy, right? Oh, uh... Yeah. Thanks, Bianfu. I'll even read it for you. Ahem. <clears throat> Dear Moloch Lafayette, I hope that this letter finds you in good health and high spirits. Thankfully, I'm doing well myself, with no major changes to report. Bianfu's taking all this so seriously. 
It's so rare to actually see him like this. As you're aware, I've been spending my days ironing Magilu's outfits, sewing her buttons, and washing her hat and tremendously long socks. Recently, however, I made the mistake of remarking to her that she might not have been quite as slender as she once was in her younger years. She hung me upside down from the roof in the middle of the cold! I nearly became a frozen Norman Sicole! It was so horrible that I couldn't stop my tears from flowing down my little cheeks! Bien! Ah, <laughs> uh, there's the Bienfu we know and love. But all you wrote about in that letter was yourself. And you even read it out loud yourself. That's okay. Thanks, Bienfu. It feels nice to get a letter. That's so kind of you to say. I think I might cry again. <laughs> Velvet, let me in this instant. You can't come in. And if you do, I'll eat you. It's not just your room, you know. You took an oath to obey my every command if you lost our fight. And I'm commanding you to wait just a little longer. <sighs> what are you doing out here in the hall? I left to go out on a little errand, but when I came back, Velvet shut me out of our room. I've been standing here for over half an hour, but she seems no closer to letting me in. I don't know what to do. Any idea what she's doing inside there? No, I don't have a clue. All I can tell you is that sometimes I can hear something like deep breathing and soft moaning. Well, she must be doing something in there she doesn't even want a fellow woman to see. Something she doesn't want seen. Do you think maybe she's weighing herself? Even if you allow for getting undressed and then dressed again, there's no chance it takes half an hour to weigh yourself. Could she be putting on makeup? I've been yelled at for barging in on that before. Although not by Velvet. That's just because you're a guy. I hardly think Velvet would have a problem with me seeing that. This is no time to just stand there lollygagging, kiddo! Velvet is obviously in great danger this very minute! Her life is hanging in the balance! She's right! You know Velvet! Never letting her weaknesses show! She probably kicked Madame Eleanor out because she didn't want anyone to see her in such bad, bad pain! That would explain the heavy breathing and moaning, too. Now that you mention it... Right before I left, she had a stiff expression and she did not look well. Well, kiddo, are you going to abandon her in her time of need? The moment to test your mettle has come at last! Test... my mettle. Will you go in there or won't you? The fated decisive hour has finally arrived! Velvet! What is it, V? Huh? Well, I thought you might die. So I... So I... Seriously? A little cleaning isn't gonna kill me. But you were looking pale, and we could hear you breathing strangely and making weird sounds. I don't think I was breathing strangely. Then what was that noise? It sounded like... <sighs> <sighs> when you're cleaning glass, you breathe on it first, don't you? Then what about the moaning? The inn has this room cleaned regularly, but they missed a lot of the details. When I looked at the cups, I saw they still had tea stains from whoever drank out of it last. That's enough to make anybody moan in disappointment. Oh, I see. But if you told me you were cleaning the room, I would have offered to help you now. Everyone has their own unique way of cleaning things, so in the end it's just faster to do it myself. My sister had her own ways, and I'm sure you do too, right? <sighs> yeah, I guess so. Anyway, I'm finished so you can come back in again. Whew, what a relief to have that all done. <laughs> I spy with my little eyes a kiddo who's spying at my bewitching waist. Oh, sorry. I just couldn't help it. What are those books, anyway? Oh, that's a great question. Since you asked, I'll reveal the secrets of my tomes just for you. 
On the right, I've got my household ledger in the back, and my magic encyclopedia in the front. That one I mostly use for oil blotting paper. What's oil blotting paper? It's a girl thing. The two on the left are my heavy book, which I use for flower pressings, and then my super pop-up book. A super pop-up book? When you open it, it pops out with the force of a raging river! When an enemy has me cornered, I can just open it up facing a nearby wall and pop! Instant getaway! The only downside is that it's a real pain to try to get closed again, so I haven't used it in years. What about the book right in front? That's actually Lair Cake. Whoa, really? Seared into its batter are precious bits of knowledge. Eating it is just as good for your brain as it is for your stomach. Wow, I had no idea that was possible. He's taking this so seriously, I almost feel bad. All of your books are so interesting, Moggy Lou. That's really cool. There's no end to your curiosity, is there? What do you say? Want to take a closer look? Boy, would I. If you really do, then say, Moggy Lou, I want to get to know you better. Moggy Lou, I want to get to know you better. All right, I accept. I'll reveal to you my most private secrets. Wow, so that's what's on the other side of these books. I wouldn't have ever guessed that. What the? What are you doing with Luffy Set? He said he wanted to see, so I'm showing him. You have no right to stand in the way of his desires. It's my job to protect him as his vessel, especially from someone so wicked as yourself. Also, what you're doing runs contrary to public decency. Witches aren't supposed to be decent. These bindings with the locks on them. This style used to be really popular during the Meliodas dynasty. Now that I know you're such a bad influence for him, I'll be keeping a closer eye on you. If you can't learn to take it easy, nobody's ever going to want to marry you, you know. Like you're a shining example of marriage material yourself. Hey, Moggy Lou, could you turn them over one more time? I want to see how the books attach to your belt. Yeah, sure. <sighs> Hey, Moggy Lou, I was wondering about that book you have on your waist. The one you called your heavy book, for flower pressings. Your curiosity truly knows no bounds, does it, kiddo? Okay, nobody else knows this, but since you're so interested, I'd hate to leave you hanging. My heavy book, the one I use for flower pressings, is none other than... a collection of Bienfu's poetry. Bienfu likes to write poems? Yep. You'd never guess it, but he's actually just about the best Moloch poet around. Some people even call him the Great Norman Poet. Here, I'll read you my favorite one. If there is something unimportant happening to the East, I'm made to go there and back. If there is something unimportant happening to the West, I'm made to go there and back. I can never rest nor be at peace. Every day my life is a living hell. That's heavy stuff isn't it that's what makes it so good for pressing flowers it's so wonderfully oppressively heavy moggy lou your face has gone all sinister looking hey bienfu i have a question for you i know moggy lou likes to call herself a witch and all that but what is she really the obvious guess would be that she's an exorcist but i don't think i ever saw her name in the roster that's not surprising. She is indeed a bona fide dark witch. I should know. I saw one night just how scary she could be. It's enough to keep you awake at night. It was near the crater of a volcano. Above the bubbling magma sat a huge cauldron. Inside the cauldron, a blood-red liquid stickily simmered, boiling in the hellfire heat. When droplets splattered onto Miss Mogilu's cheeks, she just cackled and licked it off. And she kept the cauldron boiling for three days and three nights. What was she making? Strawberry jam. What? What's scary about that? I was just getting to the scary part. Instead of using sugar, she put in soy sauce, cooking wine, and liquor! Soy sauce and strawberries? Is that normal? 
You wouldn't think so, but that contrasted sweetness, sourness, and saltiness actually makes it taste great. Not that someone like you would understand the appeal. You have to have a refined palate like mine to appreciate it. Wait, I've heard of that. You can boil things in soy sauce and wine to preserve them. When you do it with strawberries, it's called strawberry soup. That's right! Actually, strawberry soup has sea urchin and abalone, not strawberries. It's just called that because the sea urchin plumps up like berries. And it's not preserved either. Really? Well, I had no idea! Wow, I really liked it too! I wonder if the reason she's never made it for me again is because she realized the mix-up! Now that I think about it, that's not the only thing I like that she made one time! Like durian jellies and the candied sweetfish, too! I think I see what's going on here. What does the food she's made more than once taste like? It's just normal stuff, like what you guys always have! Only a truly scary witch could hide that much cooking talent behind such plain-tasting food with no one the wiser! Grimoire always looks like she never wants to do any work, but despite all her grumbling, when she starts a job, she gets it done. And quickly, too. She's frank, but she still takes care not to say anything to hurt anyone's feelings. I have to say, I, I like that in a woman. It's charming. Well, sorry if I'm inconsiderate and charmless then. Uh, I didn't mean it like that. You're all still so young and have led different lives. Can't fault you for being you. Well, if you're saying we lack a certain air of maturity, I might not 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 disagree. That's for sure. It's true Lord Artorius has scolded my lack of composure at times. Although I do get the impression that Grimoire has been dependable like that since she was young. And it's a good impression at that. Old Grim's been that way since the day she was born. I hate to admit it, but her combination of insightful words and deadpan expression has charmed the hearts of many a Moloch. At her peak, she had a fan club 8,848 members strong, and her dinner shows would sell out the day the tickets went on sale. Malakim came by the droves to doze off listening to her live readings of ancient books. Wow! I had no idea she was so popular. Yeah, she's even a regular feature in Who's Who Among Norman. Now that I think about it, I could see how a person could interpret her lethargy as patience and her vague dispassion as maturity and poise. Compared to her, I'm just... <sighs> Were you just trying to imitate her? <sighs> no, I didn't mean to. Whether you meant to or not, that kind of felt like her just now. I can see it in you, waiting to be awakened. That sophisticated charm. Me? Sophisticated and charming? I don't know. Try talking like her. You know how she lets her sentences trail off. This is your make-or-break moment here. Uh... All right. I think I know what you mean. Here goes nothing. Oh. What do you think, Laffy said? Do I sound like her? It feels a little off, but you're definitely doing it. I think. Aw, <sighs> uh, you don't have to grow up, Madame Eleanor. You are cute just the way you are. Uh, you stay out of this, Bianfu! <laughs> I know this smell. Yeah, it's Prince Percival's fragrant wood perfume. When I told him I'd never smelled it before, he put a little on my sleeve to try it out. I love the smell of the royal family's perfume. It's distinct, but not overpowering. It's made from Fandaria trees. Conifers that grow in a snowy land. I've noticed that you and Velvet and Mogilu smell nice, too. Do you all wear the same perfume? We do? We don't use that stuff, but maybe you're smelling the soap we use. Oh, can only the royal family wear fragrant wood? No. Some fragrances, including the Fandaria-scented ones, only the royal family can use. But most don't have any such restriction. If they all smell so good on humans, why doesn't everyone use them? You know, I've never thought about that. Why do you think that is, Aizen? It's a bit complicated. To explain it right, I'd have to start with the history of bathing in Midgand. A few hundred years ago, people believed they would die if they took a bath. They were so terrified of baths that they wouldn't even go near one. 
I can't believe people would be scared of taking a bath. Why would that even happen? Well, at the time, a deadly plague was running rampant, and people thought that it could be transmitted through bath water. Bear in mind that this was all before we had proper plumbing or techniques to purify water. People couldn't just bathe anywhere. Sewers like the one we used to sneak through Logris are a fairly recent construction, only around a century old. Some people even thought bathing at all was unhygienic. Right. As bathing went out of style, the royal family started to use these fragrant woods. Covering up their bad smell with a good one. Yep. As a result, their perfumes used to be far more potent, to the point where you couldn't even tell if it smelled good anymore. But nowadays, nobody actually believes that bathing can make you sick, right? As civilization advanced, plumbing became widespread, and baths themselves became much cleaner fixtures than they used to be. And the fragrant woods fell out of favor because they were no longer necessary, right? To the contrary. As the people gained prosperity, the perfumes became a popular display of wealth. The newfound popularity didn't last long, however, thanks to the propagation of a new disease. One that didn't transmit through baths. Demon blight, you mean? With the rise of demon attacks, life outside the city walls became increasingly difficult. With fragrant woods now harder to come by, the perfumes once again became the domain of royalty. I guess that means that fragrant woods share a long and complicated history with plagues. To cover up the truth of malevolence, the powers that be spread rumors of a demon plague, continuing their time-honored tradition of covering up one stink with another. <laughs> so, what do you think of the perfume? Do you like it? Yeah, it smells nice. But I think I like the smell of soap better. Huh? May I ask you a question? What? You're an Earth Moloch, yes? Why live on the sea when your kind sinks in water? I live on the sea because I'm an Earth Moloch. I'd be curious to hear more. Eifried used to go on about how we should accept what we were born with. But one time he joked about the idea of a pirate who couldn't swim, and he laughed and laughed. I wanted to clobber him right then and there, but it wouldn't have changed the fact that I can't swim. I didn't want some predestined elemental affinity to control who I was. Instead, I underwent tough training to overcome it. Well, I guess that's one way to approach it. Did this training of yours bear any fruit? Well, as soon as I stepped into a river, a big flood brought down a landslide from the mountains and swallowed me up. Then, when I tried going into a lake, the seaweed suddenly multiplied and tangled around my body, nearly drowning me. And then, finally, when I tried jumping into the ocean, a huge whirlpool formed with me at its very center. <sighs> the Reaper's Curse at play? As far as I'm concerned, my Earth Affinity and my Reaper's Curse aren't much different, in that they've both shackled me since I came into being. This is about pushing and challenging the constraints I was born with. Hmm. So, did you eventually learn how to swim? Pretty much, yeah. As long as I never let go of my portable life preserver. Oh, huh. <laughs> the oldest known map of the world was made by... Wow! It took them decades! You always look so happy when you've got your nose in a book. What's so interesting about the one you've got there? It's a book about surveying. When I read it, I can imagine myself traveling afar and making maps of the world. It sounds like so much fun. I know just how you feel. I know Mogilu and the others don't understand. But I just can't help but feel excited when I think about us completing a map of the entire world. It's the thought of treasure that gets me more fired up! Obviously, there's treasure waiting to be unearthed too, but that's more of a bonus on the side. Crossing uncrossable oceans, going to lands where none have gone before. The voyage itself, the dance with death, these things hold value greater than that of any treasure. Ah, adventure! Truly the romance of the quest we call life! Luffy said, you had a map, didn't you? The one you dropped when we first met? It's a world map I got when I was with the Abbey. But I only checked out the places really close by. 
I could hardly call it adventure. There's more to adventuring than visiting far-off lands and sailing stormy seas, you know. Adventures are about achieving your ambitions and leaping across the walls we've built to protect ourselves, no matter the danger that waits on the other side. There are no big or small adventures. Even if I only went to Helavis in the Fegal ice caps? Think of it like this. When you sneaked out of town without the Abbey noticing, when you walked the land and compared it to your map, how did that make you feel? It was scary, but fun. Exhilarating. Then it was an adventure. The map you made within yourself is a treasure that's only yours. Wow! My very own treasure! I saw Benwick and the other crew members get into a serious fight over whether cats or dogs were better. I don't get what the big deal is. I can't believe you could say such a thing! No conflict is more perilous than the one that has dogged mankind since the dawn of civilization! In the shadow of every war are the battles of dog lovers and cat lovers. Between each side lies a divide, maybe not all that deep, but unbridgeable all the same. I'd say we're lucky that the squabble you saw didn't escalate into anything more serious. I had no idea it was such a big deal. So what side do all of you fall on? I am, without a doubt, a cat person. Cats and witches have a long history together. Personally, I prefer dogs because they can cohabit with humans while following rules. But I like cats too, because they're cute. What about you, Rokuro? Shigure liked cats, so I don't. But I like dogs even less. Always wagging their tails for their masters. <laughs> I feel the same way. Dogs will trade anything for food. Learning tricks, wagging their tails, getting friendly, and in time, even forgetting to howl. I think that's too cynical. Dogs make efforts to please humans so that we can live together. They're friendly and compassionate creatures. Then does that make you a cat person, Aizen? Actually, I like squirrels best. When I lived with my sister, the nearby forest had lots of nice, fluffy squirrels that would let me pet them. This isn't about squirrels. It's about cats and dogs. You have to pick a side. If I had to choose, yeah, it'd be cats. There's something lovable about the way they act, especially when you spoil them. It reminds me a lot of my sister. What about you, Velvet? Cats or dogs? Dogs. They don't betray you. You always have to be so serious, don't you? So Velvet and Eleanor like dogs, while Mogilu and Aizen prefer cats. And Rokuro doesn't care for either one. That makes you our tiebreaker, kiddo. The fate of this showdown is in your hands. It is? Now that you're no longer the Abbey's dog, perhaps you're thinking of being one for Velvet's column? What has that got to do with anything? We're just talking about which animal we like. If you're getting so angry over this, he's going to have no choice but to pick dogs. I just told you- No more fighting! This is clearly getting out of hand, so why don't you all agree that you're Bienfu people and make up already? And what makes you special enough to have Bienfu people? Because I can be loyal like a dog, but also do my own thing like a cat. If you pick me, everybody wins. I don't think it works that way. Not that I really care, but who ended up winning the fishing competition when we were trying to catch a Therian? Man, that was a while ago. I lost because I came away with nothing. No, it was a draw. As I'm sure everyone remembers, all I fished up were octopus demons. We were competing over who would catch the Therian. Demons didn't count, so my score was 0-2. No, the loss is mine, and I'm not giving it to you. That's not just something you can up and decide like that. In fact, by fishing up those octopus demons, I put everyone in danger. That should count for negative points. I lost. Who cares? It was all in fun. I care. Every competition must have a winner and a loser, no matter what. That's just how I see it. Yeah, I'm with Eisen on this one. It doesn't do anyone any good to make the final results murky. I can't believe I'm going to do this. Eisen, your curse would mean that the odds were stacked against you from the start. That doesn't make for a fair competition, does it? Yeah, she's got a good point. We'll just have to settle the score some other way. What can you guys do? Play cards? Chess? What? Cards are a no-go for me. 
I'll just end up drawing jokers. And I can play shogi, but I don't know chess. Then what about arm wrestling? Would that work? Whoa, whoa! Having a demon and a Moloch clasp hands is just asking for trouble with malevolence. You're both adults, so why not a drinking contest? That's it! If we have a drinking contest, we'll be able to compete on an even playing field. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with that. I'll have the crew bring out the drinks. Well, that's one way of resolving it, I suppose. Whatever gets it done, I'm not gonna complain. If you guys are gonna have a drinking contest, you're gonna need some tasty snacks to go with all that alcohol, right? Definitely! Let's go out and fish us some snacks. Yeah, let's take out the little boat. We can even pick up where we left off our fishing competition. Didn't we just figure out he can't really fish? Ugh, we were just about to finally resolve this mess. Why'd you have to go and stick your nose into it? What? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do anything wrong! <laughs> It must not feel great only ever getting tails, I bet. Nah, I don't really mind that much. It's way too late for me to start letting that bother me. Yeah, but wouldn't it be nice to get heads at least once? Hell, I know I'd like to see that, and I bet Laffy said here does too. Yeah, I do. Right? That's why I've brought something a little special. Ta-da! What's so special about that coin? It looks identical to the one Aizen already has. The front side does, yes, but both sides of the coin are actually heads. I had Kurogane make it for me custom. If both sides are heads, then not even the Reaper's curse can stop it. Well, yeah, but that's cheating. What's the point in getting heads if it's rigged that way? It's not cheating. It's called effort and hard work. How? If you always work hard and never give up, you'll make your own way forward. All right, I'm in. I'll get that heads for you. <sighs> what? That crow just flew off with the coin! Those birds are attracted to shiny objects, I suppose. Damn it! I can't even win against a crow! Don't sweat it! I figured something like this might happen, so I had a backup ready. Go on, give it a shot. You'll show that curse who's boss this time. All right, here goes. I don't believe it! Now Prince Percival's griffin's gone and eaten the other coin right out of the air! Are you kidding me? Not to worry. I've got a spare backup. It's time to put that curse on notice. Right. Here I go. You gotta be kidding me! Reaper's curse or not, does it really have to go this far over a damn coin? It's fine, really. I had a feeling it'd turn out like this. Well, I sure didn't. Yeah, me neither. Wow, Kamoana. I see you've taught Orthy and Russ a lot of tricks. That ain't easy by any stretch. Great job. Yeah, all my hard work is playing off. Paying off, you mean? I guess so, huh? <laughs> what all have you taught them? What's normal? Shake and sit and fetch, right? When I tell them to shake, they shake each other's paws. When I tell them to sit, Orthy lies down and then Russ sits on top of him like he's a chair. Wow, with those skills? You could probably become the best trainer in all of Midgand. I can't take such a challenge lightly, you know. Bienfu would be nowhere without all the training I put him through. I won't have some newbie stealing my thunder. <laughs> well, I don't plan on losing to you either. I think I smell a challenge brewing. What else have you taught them, Kamoana? If you throw a bone, they'll both jump down on it and eat it. Well, Bienfu can take bones and throw them in the garbage. I'm just cleaning up after you eat. I tell them to say sorry. 
and Orthy puts his paw on my lap and looks all sad, while Russ tries to comfort him. Bianfu has such strong resolve that he never apologizes, no matter how much I yell at him! Bien! Oh, and the boys can also howl along whenever I sing! Bianfu howls too, just every time I have to punish him! Bien! They can greet people normally too, not just with barking. Like, they can say, Hurro! Bianfu, tongue twister! Which which would would a which would which be which of a which would which could be which would? She sells sea spells on the seashore. The spells she sells are surely sea spells. So if she sells spells on the seashore, I'm sure she sells seashore spells. Keep going. The six, six sorceress is six, she, ah, bien, ow, ow, ow. I bit my tongue. You almost made it. How could you mess up at the end? That's the easiest part of the whole thing. I'm sorry, Miss Mogulu. I got careless at the end. Just please, don't leave me! Ow! We can have that discussion later. Anyway, Kamalana, what do you think? That's pretty quality training, wouldn't you say? Um, I think you need to work on loving and trusting each other. That's what training's about. Grimoire, could we talk? You sound so serious. Like it's the eve of the final battle. Well, isn't it? Can't you let yourself get caught up in the moment for a change? Getting caught up in the moment is for young, foolhardy lovers. So, what is it you want to talk about? I just figured I should drop by since... Well, like I said, the final battle with Inominat is coming up and all. Ugh, you're talking like you're saying your last goodbyes. It's just that we're up against a lot. Even Miss Mogilu doesn't know what the future holds for us, and she almost always has that stuff figured out. Whether she has it figured out or not, it is our lot in life to follow our vessels and fight to the very end. That's what I've always thought, so I just dealt with Miss Mogilu's craziness up till now. But she's never thanked me for it. No, good job, Bienfu. No, I'm glad I'm your vessel. Not even something like, I'll introduce you to a cute girl when it's all over. It'd be nice to hear a little gratitude from her, even just once. Surely you know she's not the type to do that sort of thing, though, yes? That's all the more reason to want just one brief glimpse at who she is underneath. If you're so unhappy, it's not too late to switch back to the Abbey's side and become an informant again. What's the point in that? I don't know anything they'd want, and they wouldn't have any use for me there. So you lack confidence in your own abilities. Miss Moggy Lewis let me come with her wherever she went, and her talents have gotten us this far. But now that we have to fight Inominat, I'm worried. I don't know what use I can be for her. Or if I can keep her safe. But you'll still go, won't you? Yeah, of course. Or else my name isn't Norman Brave. See, you can do this. You've been keeping Moggy Lou safe this whole time. With all the emotional pain she's been through, she's needed someone as thick-skinned and tenacious as you. She may talk like she doesn't care, but she wouldn't have tracked you down and renewed your pact if she didn't. When you put it like that, bien! All right, you've convinced me! That's right. You just trust an old Norman therapist's good advice. It won't steer you wrong. Wow! I'd have never expected you to actually make a joke like that, Grimoire. I just thought I'd get caught up in the moment like you wanted. Ah. <sighs> Hey, Mogulu, I just remembered something. You still haven't given me that hundred gold you owe me. Why, I have no earthly idea what this hundred gold is that you're talking about. Don't play dumb with me. It's a hundred gold. Pay up. Ooh, cold as ever. I think I saw icicles coming out of your mouth. I risked my life accompanying you on your quest for revenge, and now you want me to give you a hundred gold on top of that? Well, I've had enough of this treatment. I'm going home. Okay, then. So long. You're not even trying to stop me! Surely 
Finally, you can appreciate that a feisty fighter such as myself is indispensable to your efforts to take down Inominat, yes? But I'm not heartless. There's still time to make amends. I can ignore these transgressions under the right conditions. <sighs> okay. If either of us gets swallowed up by Inominat, the other one has to pay her a hundred gold. Hmm? You lost me there. We're betting a hundred gold on who gets eaten by Inominat. If you win, your debt will be wiped clean. You can't complain about that. Oh, I can complain, believe me. Bringing up this 100 gold that I'm not even obligated to pay, hiding your kindness behind your cold words, and I'm just getting started complaining! Do you think I wouldn't notice this attempt to take advantage of an emotional witch to manipulate me into helping you defeat Inominat? Mogilu, I... I'm putting down 100 bajillion gold! That's how much you'll owe me if you make it out alive. You have three seconds to back out. Three, two, one. <laughs> Zero! That's on for real now. I'll have to stick around for my money. I guess I have no choice but to help defeat Inominat and Artorias and to bring you back in one piece. You always have to have it your way, don't you? Uh-uh-uh. That's not what you should be saying. I think you meant to say, Thank you, Muggy Lou, my best, best friend. <sighs> Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mogilu, my best, best friend. But so we're clear, I'm staying alive on my own terms, not just because you told me to. And you say I'm the one who always has to have it my way. But think twice before trying to put one over on the great witch Mogilu, she who delivers retribution and comeuppances! If I cared, that is, which I don't. Do you really think we'll be able to win? I'd like to just tell you not to worry about it, but I know that can't be helped. In my mind, too much worry can make you lose battles you should be able to win. I wish I knew how to be like you. I mean, except for turning into a demon. It's just about keeping your mind calm, isn't it? Me, I try to think about what I'm gonna do after a big fight. Like, what I'm gonna have to eat, or, or what I'm gonna read next. Anything like that. All right, then. Let me ask. What do you plan on doing when this battle is all over? Hmm? You've already beaten Lord Shigure. Once Lord Artorius and Inominat are out of the picture, there will be no better sword fighter in the whole world. What exactly will you set your sights on next in life? First of all, I still have a ways to go before I'm truly better than Shigure. What? But you've already beat him. Only by fighting with three blades. If we had matched greatsword against greatsword, I wouldn't have been on his level. Besides, it's a big world. The next great opponent could be out there anywhere. You really are a man of unassailable conviction, Rokuro. That's just because I'm a demon. What about you? What'll your next move be? I want to keep doing whatever I can to help people. Not as an exorcist, but as another human being. Just to give you a fair warning. If you ever attack humans like other demons do, I won't hesitate to take you down. Oh yeah? I'm pretty tough, you know. Don't worry about me. When we win this battle, I'll have the confidence I need to become even stronger. Then I guess you've answered your initial question. Yeah, let's go. We have a fight to win. Damn straight! Even after we defeat Inominat, you'll still be able to see me normally, right, Aizen? Yeah. We spiritual beings like Malachim and demons will still be aware of each other like before. But nearly every human will stop seeing us, just like Magilu said. Does that make you sad? Doesn't it make you sad? I mean, Benwick and the other pirates won't be able to see you anymore. It doesn't matter whether they can see me or not. They already know that I'll always be right there with them. When I go back to being a ghost to them, I'll be sure to make their voyages very interesting. Oh yeah! Back before they could see you, they thought you were a ghost haunting their ship. Yeah. It'll be just like old times again. So, your life will go on, alongside the pirates in their ship, even if they can't see you? But our eventual parting is inevitable. That's something we can never escape as Malachim, for we live far longer than any human. Parting is always hard. 
If you don't want that pain, the only way to avoid it is to shun all contact with humans. Some Malachim never leave our heavenly realm, where the conflicts of foolish men are but distant rumble, hardly felt or heard. But to me, humans are an inspiration, living to their fullest with the limited time they have. Yeah. Not that Malachim are immortal, either. We have our own ends to face, myself included. I don't know if that day will come in five hundred years or a thousand, or even tomorrow. So I choose to live here with them, moment by moment, giving it everything I've got. Benwick and the other pirates know how you feel. That's why you won't be sad when they can no longer see you. Yeah, I believe that's true. But I... It's okay to feel lost. Let yourself wander for a while. But whatever you end up choosing, decide it for yourself. In the end, that's all that matters. Yeah. Okay. Benwick told me that you can mop the floor with the water you've used for washing rice, and it'll make the wood shiny. Is that true? It is. Not only does it get the floor clean, it'll put on a layer of rice brown oil at the same time. Two birds with one stone. Wow, that's awesome! I didn't know that! Yeah. Rice water has a lot of uses. The first time you use a new earthenware pot, boil rice water in it, and you'll extend its lifespan. And if you use it when you're rehydrating dried fish, it'll tenderize it and take away the fishy smell too. And if you water plants with it, it acts as a fertilizer. It's really useful stuff. Wow, look at you, Velvet. Maybe I could see you with a family after all. You don't have to act so surprised. Still, I've never read that in any of my books before. How did you end up learning all that? I learned from Salika, who learned it from our mom. It's just been passed down across the family. Wow! What else did you learn from your sister growing up? Selica taught me everything our mom knew about cooking, from the basics to more advanced techniques. Speaking of which, rice water is really useful when cooking, too. If you use it to boil radishes, it'll get rid of their bitter taste. When you use it to boil bamboo shoots or burdock roots, they'll soften and take on a nice white color. My mother taught Salika that anyone who threw away rice water wasn't qualified for housework, and my sister passed it on to me, too. You know so many cool things! When I needed to make my bra... When you need to make a child eat their vegetables, it'll go over better if you can cook them tender and not so bitter. I bet you'd make a pretty good mom one day, Velvet. You really think so? Actually, since you're here, Bienfu, I have to ask. Those are discarded vegetables on your tray there, aren't they? Yeah, but they're just raw scraps left over from cooking. I was on my way to throw them out just now. What are you talking about? That's all still good stuff you can use. Look at those radish leaves. Dice them up, fry them in oil, add soy sauce, cooking wine, bonito flakes, and sesame seeds, and voila! A perfectly healthy topping for rice. And that potato skin? If you wipe the inner side on a mirror, it won't fog up. Put some salt on those lemon rinds and you can use them to scrub a wash basin sparkling clean. Holy cow, Velvet! You're a treasure trove of knowledge! You know what's been bothering me? These pirates are way too wasteful with their food. They leave so much garbage. Uh, you might be getting a little carried away here. Yeah, I think you've made the jump from potential mom to bothersome in-law. Phoenix is finally gone! It's okay for you to come out now, Grimoire! <sighs> He's so stuffy, as always, that he made me sweat, and I was even hiding. Now that I think about it, neither of you showed your faces when Phoenix was here, did you? Why wouldn't you two want to see a fellow Norman? <sighs> I guess that asks for an explanation. All right, I think I can tell you now anyway. Broadly speaking, Norman fall into two different categories. Dog Norman and Cat Norman. The ones who like to be around humans, like Phoenix, are your dog types. The ones who prefer to stick around objects and places are the cat types. 
I've heard people say that dogs get attached to the human and cats get attached to the home. So, since Mogulu's relied on you a lot over the years, does that make you a dog, Norman? No, not really. My powers actually work with Miss Mogulu's guardians, not Miss Mogulu herself. That makes me a cat type. Though, actually, considering how I serve a witch, I'd be a cat type either way. Anyway, back on topic. Dog Norman like to live among lots of humans in comfort and style. Cat Norman like me and Grimoire would rather live in forests and ruins and pass our time in idle leisure. Some, ourselves included, don't conform with expectations, instead choosing to live as we please alongside humans. What does this have to do with wanting to avoid Phoenix? There's a gap between us that can't be bridged. Like the difference between sky blue and sea blue. Come on, aren't sky blue and sea blue basically the same color? Maybe to your untrained eye, but to those who care, there's a perceptible difference in hue, slight though it might be. Whatever it is that separates them is impossible to overcome. I didn't realize it could be such a big deal. Let me ask you guys this. Are pudding and custard the same? No, definitely not. If I ordered one, I wouldn't want to be served the other. Those still sound more or less the same to me, too. Hmm. What if I said it was like the difference between sherbet and sorbet? Oh, yeah, there is a difference there. Although I usually can't remember which is which. So, like the difference between a hoagie and a sub sandwich? But those two are the same. Anyway, you get the point now, surely. We've long had our differences, and they put us in perpetual conflict. But what good does that do? Actually, on that note, is Aizen's sister going to be okay with Phoenix around? That much I wouldn't worry about. He can be obnoxiously brash and talks a lot of nonsense sometimes. But if nothing else, Phoenix has a strong sense of responsibility. Rest assured, she's in good hands. Although if you work him too hard, he'll start making speeches about uprisings and insurrections and all that stuff. Hey, do you think Dial sheds his skin like other reptiles? I don't know. On the outside, he looks like an Emir monitor lizard. But he used to be a human and is a demon now, so... I kind of doubt it. Oh, my ears are burning red hot right now. Were you guys talking about me? Yeah, we were. So, Dial, do you ever shed your skin? I'm really curious. Tell me, tell me. That's a little rude to just ask someone, don't you think? You do, don't you? I mean, you are a lizard. No, I don't. Aw, I think you'd be way cooler if you did. Well, he's regrown his tail before. Oh yeah, that's right! Lizards can regrow their tails! That must mean you really do shed, right? No, those are two totally different things. Although, I did get a bad enough sunburn yesterday that my skin started to peel. Maybe that counts. <laughs> Huh? Kamoana's not here, is she? No, she's not. Are you looking for her? No, the opposite, actually. I'm hiding from her. Kamoana saw my tail fall off, and now she's absolutely obsessed about it. I'm worried that if I'm not careful, she'll try to sneak up on me and give me a big scare, and I'll drop this new tail after it's just regrown. Is dropping your tail such a big deal? Well, if I need to make a quick escape, I can't exactly drop my tail without having one to drop. Oh, I see. Whoa! Awesome! I swear, the second he has a spare moment, he buries himself in his books. Knowledge opens up bigger worlds. I imagine that back when Teresa was bossing him around, reading was a fun escape, an adventure in and of itself. Hmm? What's up, you guys? You're reading a pretty hard book there, aren't you? This? 
It's about dinosaurs. It says that long before humans were around, these huge creatures ruled the world. There are so many different kinds, like Tyrannosaurs and Triceratops and Brachiosaurs. They're all so cool. They look like dragons to me. They look similar, but dinosaurs couldn't live inside volcanoes, and they didn't do well in the cold either. But they were crazy huge and strong. Nothing else could even compete with them. I bet they would have made for great sparring partners. I think this Gigantospinosaurus might be my favorite. Those two huge points jutting out from both sides of its body make it look just like you and your two swords. Actually, it's also known as the dual-bladed dragon. Wow, it really does sound like a perfect match for me then. Okay, so if they weren't dragons, what were they? They look a lot like lizards. Maybe they're like my ancestors or something. But you used to be a human. <laughs> Damn, I think I might have gotten a bit too used to this new body of mine. I wonder if their tails can fall off too. Hey, Kuragane, let me ask you something. More complaining, is it? Come on, don't be like that. Every time I turn around, Velvet or one of the pirates is telling me to go make some delivery to some island. I can never get a break. Isn't that just a sign they think you're a dependable guy? Maybe, but I don't see them sending you off on errands. It's like they take one look at your face and decide to leave you alone. I don't have a face. Oh, right, sorry. A slip of the tongue. Maybe you just don't know how much work I do around here. It's more than you think. Anything to do with iron, I do it. Making tools, repairing things. What do you take me for? Some kind of cheeky freeloader? I don't even have cheeks. <laughs> You're too funny! But doesn't it ever annoy you to have all these kids giving you orders? I've spent my entire life thinking of nothing but forging swords. It's been centuries since I've interacted with youngsters like them. They can be a hassle. But at least it's a new hassle. Yeah, that's what I thought at first. So I went along with whatever they asked. But I've been too nice, so they keep pushing work onto me. Maybe if I hadn't been so helpful, they would have stayed out of my face like they stay out of yours. I don't have a face. That's not the point. Aren't you even listening to what I'm saying here? You need to make up your mind. You and I got on this ship alongside these people, who are putting themselves in great danger in order to live the lives of their choosing. If you don't like it, then go on and get off this ship with your tail between your legs. Yeah, except I don't have a tail right now. Hmm... Did you ever figure out if that bug was a stag or a rhinoceros beetle? Actually, I still haven't really looked into it. Why not? Weren't Rokuro and Aizen pretty curious to find out too? They're why I haven't. They both have really strong opinions, and they both make a believable argument. And if I determined it was a new kind of beetle entirely, my decision would change the very course of their fates. Their fates? I think you're exaggerating things. Hey, what are you guys talking about? We're still hashing out what that rhino stagros really is. Kiddo here is holding off on his final decision because he's worried about how you'll take it. You're both adults. Can't one of you just give in so we can move on? It's a rhinoceros beetle. I'm not backing down on that. No, it's a stag beetle. Why not just take off the pointy bits? Then we can all agree it's just a plain old beetle. Simple. Sounds good to me. Don't even joke about that. If you took away my swords, I wouldn't have anything left. Same thing goes for a stag beetle and its pincers. And taking away a rhinoceros beetle's horns is disrespectful to its way of life, and to even suggest it is just plain wrong. No, if we're going to argue it out over this, we need to exhaust every possible angle before coming to a conclusion. It's the right thing to do. Madam Eleanor! Here's that field guide to rare insects of Midgand you wanted me to get you! Thanks, Bianfu. Surely this book will have something about that bug. <gasps> Yeah, here it is. This beetle's real name is... Argonathocrasis, 
the thick jaw beetle. It's named for its jaws? That must make it a stag. It's a drone beetle. The field guide says it's a really rare variety, too. I guess that's that. No, you're wrong. It's a brand new species. I call it the Lafayette Rhino Stagros. That's my decision, and I'm not backing down. Hey, Eisen, is there uh anything we can do about the Prince's Hawk, Griffin? I mean, every day it goes out on these hunts or whatever and brings back the weirdest stuff. It's making a real mess out of the deck. Hawks hunt. What's the big deal? Well, yeah. At first, it was bringing back good stuff like seaweed and fish, things we could cook with. Sure, I was glad for a while, but then it started to escalate. Now we're talking 150 kilo amber cans and 350 kilo killer swordfish that it's catching. That's not a bad thing, is it? It just means more to eat. It is when they're being dropped from the sky onto the deck, especially those killer swordfish and razor sharp bills. What if somebody gets run through by one? Can't you just warn the prince that his bird needs to be more careful? Yeah, we could, but he looks so happy watching his hawk. I hate to spoil it for him. Yeah, the prince looks so happy whenever Griffin is flying free. He kept grinning and asking Grocky all nice like if he wanted to fly some more. Grocky? That's what Kamawana kept calling Griffin. She says she came up with it by combining Griffin and Hawk. <sighs> This is probably the first time in the prince's life that he's tasted any freedom. His whole life, he's only done what duty dictated of him. Letting Griffin fly was his first free act. To the prince, Grocky is an extension of who he is. So what are we going to do? Nothing really. It's not like it really hurt anybody. But it's punctured some major holes on the deck. I'm sure even the prince knows when to rein it in. Let him have a little fun. He deserves it. I don't know about all that. I'd say the prince is letting his newfound freedom get the better of him. Hey, I was just up on deck, and it looks like Griffin's caught an elephant tuna this time. An elephant tuna? That's the really big tuna that can swallow a killer whale whole, right? That almost sounds like a demon to me. Yep, huge fish, gills like elephant ears. I saw it myself. From the looks of it, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a demon. It's crazy valuable. On a good day, it can fetch 20 million gold on the market. But there's something ominous about seeing it hovering in the air above the ship. 20 million gold? I take back everything I said. The Prince and Griffin can do whatever they want. Did she say above the ship? Oh, hell. Benwick, we need to stop Prince Percival. Aye, aye, sir. Hey! Don't drop that on the deck! Are you listening to me? This island is so amazing! It's far away from any other people and has so much hidden stuff underground! It's such a perfect hideout! Just thinking about it makes me so excited to be here! Yeah, I guess. What's wrong? You were so excited to be here before! Don't be such a drag, Lafayette! It's just that this used to be a prison. People were brought here to suffer. If you're worried about how I feel, don't be. If I really hated this place, I wouldn't have made it my base. Hell, I was imprisoned here too, but now it's the secret fort I always dreamed of. I still haven't forgiven the guard who ate all those Maron glaces I was sent. I'll let the past be the past. What part of secret fort are you not getting? Yeah. But it can't all be just for fun and games here either. In order to maximize the success of our future battles, we need to maintain and improve this base going forward. This place seems sturdy as it is. Does it really need more work put into it? Nonsense. This place was built to specialize in holding prisoners. We can make it better suit our needs. What are you proposing exactly? Well, I think we need to start with smokescreen generators. They'll be effective against intruders unfamiliar with the layout here. Of course, afterwards we'll have to clean up all the soot, but still. No thanks. I think we need something to put out fires. The fire at Helavis was really scary. We have Molochim like you who could use water arts, though. If anything happens, you can just put it out. Oh yeah, I guess that's true. 
What we really need are some secret underground tunnels. If things get too hairy here, we'll need an underground escape route. We can put in hidden doors, and even some fake ones to trick the enemy, too. We have two separate docks. That's good enough. No enemy is going to attack without taking both docks into consideration. That's why we need to build underground tunnels before anything else. But we're on an island. You know, surrounded by water. Where would these tunnels even lead to? Isn't it obvious? We'll dig underneath the sea to another uninhabited island nearby. But there are no other islands nearby. If it means getting my tunnels, I'll build an island too. Are you listening to what you're saying? It sounds like he's daydreaming to me. And what's wrong with having some dreams? This is a great opportunity we have here. You guys just don't get it. It's okay. I get where you're coming from. But they'll never understand. You might as well save your breath. How many times do I have to tell you? You just don't get it! You're the one who doesn't get it! You're just making a lot of trouble where there shouldn't be any, old man! What did you just call me? Say that again! I dare you! Both of you, shut up already! You're making so much noise that I'm tempted to devour your heads just to get some peace and quiet! Honestly, I find it odd how you pirates, who are on the same side, are always fighting. Yet you don't hesitate to rescue shipwrecked Abbey sailors who are your enemy. What's so hard to understand about that? You're treating your ally like your enemy, and your enemy like your ally. Seriously? You still have a lot to learn, apparently. What the hell does the Abbey teach you, exorcists? You talk all about going around helping people, but you don't know the first thing about sailing. Are you implying that the first thing about sailing is to help your enemies? Eh, uh, I can't explain it to the likes of you. Benwick, you explain it to our esteemed exorcist here. Well, you see, when somebody out at sea is in trouble, we don't refer to them as allies or enemies. You might think nothing of being aboard a ship, but take a moment to think about how vast and deep the ocean is. Now imagine if you weren't on a ship, if you were out here alone. Sends chills down your spine, doesn't it? I guess I can't argue with you there. Out on the sea, even just a single board of driftwood can mean the difference between staying afloat and succumbing to the depths of the water. That's why even when we raid and sink a ship, we pull up anybody who took for the water, and we bring them aboard. I know it sounds hypocritical to attack someone's ship and then rescue them out of the water, but that's just the way things are on the sea. You pirates are an interesting bunch. Plus, if the people we rescue end up getting another ship, we can attack them again and take all their new loot. You don't go and kill every last prickle boar in the forest, or else you won't have any more to hunt later. It's the way of the world. <sighs> and my faith is gone. All right, but why were you two fighting to begin with? All right, that! I remember why! Benwick here came up and started squeezing lemon juice on the perfectly fine fried chicken I just made! Who wouldn't do that? It's normal. The way you drench it takes away all the seasoning and complexity of flavor that I worked so hard to get right! No way! You have to at least put that much on, or it's not worth eating at all. Oh, forget about the chicken. Who wants to douse these two in a bucket of water instead? Make it ice water. Dial, Medissa wants to use some octopus demon to make dinner tonight. Let's go catch some together. Okay, sure. We can go as soon as I'm all done here. Okay, but hurry! You and Kamoana seem to have become really good friends. Yeah, I guess she's really latched on to me. I think it meant a lot that you protected her when we were attacked at Titania. She told me that lizards usually feel cold to touch, but that you have a warm heart deep down. That's not me at all! I'd have run away if I had my tail back, but I'd already gotten surprised and dropped it, so what else could I do but fight? Oh yeah, I guess you'd lost your tail, hadn't you? Has Kamoana stopped trying to scare you after that? It looks like it, yeah. Long enough for my tail to regrow again, at least. Oh, it's back! I didn't see. Boo! Ah! Oh no, his tail! Kamoana, sweetie. You know better than to scare Dial. But he's being so slow! He kept me waiting too long. But... 
I'm sorry. Eh, it's all right. It'll grow back again. And besides, lizard tails make the best bait for octopus demons. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Now how about we go catch us some dinner? <laughs> Yay! Let's go, Dial. Let's go!